Okay. Yep. Hey. Hello, hello. The tea, so great to see you. I'm going to introduce you. Okay. Sati Gossett is a storyteller, thinker, and an image builder. He began his film career recreating favorite movie scenes from Star Wars and other movies with his childhood friends and a Super 8 camera. His childhood was filled with legendary people from Muhammad Ali to playing games with Sidney Poitier. While working for his father, Academy Award winner Louis Gossett Jr., Sati became renowned for his filmmaking skills and was granted unprecedented access to political happenings Hollywood events and philanthropic ventures. That's just a short opening. I know you're the son of Louis Gossett Jr. And my heart goes out to you as you lost your father this past week. And I just want to hear from you and how are you feeling and what's what are you going through right now? Well, what... well thank you for having me. And, and we're literally taking it a day at a time yeah. with uh, what happened. You know, he he moved back to Los Angeles from Georgia over the holidays because he wanted to be with family. And, you know, I guess he sensed the ending was near, so he wanted to be surrounded by his family. And my brother and I, we took care of him and, you know, until God called him. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in, in those moments, it was just nice to reflect and, you know, see, he was at peace. And, you know, it's interesting or ironic in some of the conversations that I had with him is like he kind of felt that he had this weird sense of like he wasn't appreciated or there wasn't a sense of fulfillment. But against the outpouring that I've received since he's passed has been so overwhelming. It's like he couldn't be more wrong. Oh, I oh I imagine. You know, my he my phone is blown up the hook. You know, icon is the appropriate word. And one of the things that's growing up that I kind of had to come to grips with that he wasn't just my father he was everybody's father you know what he represented yeah and uh the doors that he he broke down so others could do what they do he's very aware of his position in regards to man african-american man artist entertainer and using his platform to elevate uh, yeah he worked, he was a prolific actor, but he was the first black actor to win, not just be nominated, to win an Academy Award Best Supporting Actor. That's correct. Yeah. For an officer and a gentleman, one of my favorite movies. It was he was so brilliant in that. Yeah. Did they go did they try and cast you for Lynette? <laughs> no. They should have, because you I you wish. <laughs> yeah, I played that. You were, I, I you were doing that, that, but you, you could have played Lynette. Oh, I wish, I wish, I wish, I wish I could have worked alongside someone as as incredible an actor as your father. I mean, really, what was it like growing up with him? I mean, was it difficult having someone who was working all the time? He worked prolifically. I've never seen his more. Well, yeah. I mean, yes and no. I mean, there are times where dad would be gone for like long periods of time. And then there's times where I went with him wherever he was in the world. So because of that, I, I was afforded world travel, you know, just meeting, experiencing different cultures, meeting world leaders and celebrities and rubbing yeah. elbows. And to me, it was like, you know, another day in the neighborhood because that's how oh, I grew up. You know, like we lived on uh, 8th and Longwood in Hancock Park and, you know, oh, wow. Holly Robinson was my babysitter. Um, Muhammad Ali, that's my godfather. Really? Oh, yeah. my God. Marvin Gaye, Richard Pryor, all these people, I, you know, all, all these people would come by just to hang out, you know, so that was like, okay, this is what you do. Yeah, for you, it was just normal life. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So people ask me that all the time. It's like, you know, if your parents are, your dad's a plumber, you're going to hang out with plumbers. My dad happened to be a film star. Isn't it interesting, fame? I, I'm writing a whole book on fame, the lust for fame. I mean, you know. I've been around the world and Monte Carlo, crazy adventures, but it's still, you have to come back to your soul and you have to find out what's important in life and mm -hmm. what your passion is, right? And you're a filmmaker. That's correct. Yeah. So I want to hear about you, but a little more about your dad for a second. Um, did you grow up with him? You you're born in 74, right? That's so you, correct. Yes. You're a youngin. A whippersnapper. <laughs> you're a whippersnapper. I and I see this 
I love working with you last year. We worked together on a movie and you were first AD and you were such a gentleman. You're so wonderful to work with. And your humor is incredible. Yeah. To me, I, I judge people by their humor, to be honest with you. I love funny people. So you made it so wonderful. It was Noreen McClendon was the producer and Melina Gay, our director. Yeah. Jake and Lawrence Hilton Jacobs. And I can't wait for the movie to come out. Do you know what's the, what's the latest with something about mother? They say it should be pretty soon that it's coming out. Um, okay. The, the, they're supposed to do a screening pretty soon, hopefully, hopefully before Memorial Day. Oh, yeah. But, um, yeah. You know, they, they seem to be very pleased with the product. So, um, you know, Good. it was just a, a great experience to work on that set with all those veterans. Wasn't it? It was yeah. so cool. It was like a who's who type thing. It was. It was an honor to work on that set. And it, cool when you work with people that know what they're doing it just makes the process so much easier doesn't it oh my so god i had the my dad contributed to two of my projects like oh. he did he did a voiceover for a film called juthalic oh i want to hear about this juthalic this sounds hilarious is it funny yeah, he's a you know, it's hilarious it's a, it's about a catholic girl who finds out that she's jewish <laughs> and um she sees spirits and uh, I, I, he, she sees me as a black Jesus with a leaf blower. It's very funny. <laughs> oh my and god, I gotta see this. My dad is the the narrator. I'll send you the link to it. Oh. And then um, he played the the warden in a in a crime short film I did called Ten Minutes. Oh, I read yeah. about that. Yeah, like the the picture on my Facebook page is when we were on set. Oh, and, I love that picture. Uh, he, it was it was great, you know, to be able to direct him. It's like, all right, what do I do? I'm like, yeah, go over here and do your stuff. Go go and do it. How neat to have a dad like that that you could direct. That is yeah. so cool. Yeah. Did he teach you about directing or acting? Did he teach you? Did you ever want to be an actor? I studied acting in the 2000s for a little bit uh, with Aaron Spicer. You know, he he's the one who coached J Lo and the Wayne's brothers and stuff like that. Oh, wow. And, uh, you know, it, it gave me a, I didn't have the bug for acting, you know, but yeah. it gave me a bigger understanding of what actors need to do what they do, um, especially as a writer and a director, you know, um, you know. What is that? What do they need? They need space. Yeah. And they need to feel that their contributions are valid. Yeah. Because a lot of times what's on the page or what you envision may not be what is needed, but an actor can come up with an idea or an aff affectation that you didn't even think of. And you're like, oh, wow. And it just elevates the project. So um, that's why veteran, veterans are important because they know how to do that. Yeah. A good director will bring that out. We'll be able to listen and not be too bossy. It won't be, you know, yeah. My highway. Yeah. It's so, important. Yeah. Um, what were what, are there any weird stories or anecdotes from Muhammad Ali being in your living room or you know well yeah I didn't like the man <gasps> oh tell and me. the reason why is like I'd be I was like six or seven and like we the house was two levels and my room was in the back and he would come in and I'd hear his voice coming down the hall it's like hey boy come down get your whooping and I'm like oh yeah. <laughs> this guy's here okay <laughs> And so I come down, I'm the skinny beanpole kid. And then he do the little shadow boxing thing with me. And I'm like, and I'm trying to dodge. And then one would always sign a slip and get me in the ribs. And it's Muhammad Ali. So it hurt a little bit more than usual. No way. Oh my God. And so every time I knew Muhammad was coming over, I'd like hide. And I'm like, oh yeah, this guy's here. <laughs> well, that is funny. Yeah. He never really hurt you though, right? No, I mean, but you know, just again, the little jab to the ribs. Oh my gosh. I felt it. Well, I want to touch your ribs now because you touched Muhammad Ali. Just kidding. There you go. So, what about um, your dad? Was your dad um, a funny man? Did he have a lot of adventures? Was he? Did he? He take had lots, lots of adventures, and he had a joke for every season, every occasion. Really? Well, he did. Good. He was. He was like encyclopedic with the type of jokes. You know, <laughs> whether, whether it be raunchy or political or spiritual or racial. He he just like that was always kind of the ending when we would have conversations. He would always have a joke, and I'm like, okay, here it comes. Oh my god, I love it! I and, love you know, it. and he would get them from everywhere, you know, from from friends, and you know, because of his ability to memorize. Yeah. He would uh, he'd always have a joke. 
So he was working constantly. He was one of those people that never stopped working, right? Did he ever have any lean years where he didn't work and he got depressed? Or do you know if there was a... Well, yeah. I mean, right after he won the Oscar, he didn't work for almost two years. Why? They didn't know what to do with him. Oh, wow. Interesting. And as a result of that, there was a depression and he fell into addiction. Oh, really? And, I didn't know. And, uh, you know, he dealt with that for a long time until he finally kicked it. You know, July would have been his, he would have got his 20th cake. Seriously? Yeah. He was in the 12-step program? Yep, yep. Oh, yep. my God. I wish I'd met him at meetings. That's so and cool. Then, and he helped out a lot of folks that were in the program that are out there now. Yeah. And I know because I was in the rooms with him and I saw him talking to, to him. He, wow. he shepherded a lot of folks. And, you know, we're we're working on putting a documentary together about his life and career. And oh. that's definitely a segment that uh, I want to cover. Awesome. You know, and I've talked to a couple of people already um, in the business that are ready to step up and kind of, you know, vouch for how my dad supported them. Wow. You know, he was, he was Wait, really a, uh, a man of service on all levels. That's it. That's yeah. the legacy. If you don't leave that behind, what what is it worth? Nothing. Yeah, yeah I'm mean, sure there's that. sure there's the accolades and all that's that's impressive alone, but his acts of service and how he affected millions of people, literally. And that's not hyperbole. That's right. Wow. Yeah. How wonderful. I'm so glad he found sobriety and he was able to help because people, it's the one thing I know that makes us all kind of even, no matter if you're an MIT professor, a president of the United States, a senator, or a movie star, we're all equal in that in that one thing, addiction. Yeah, everyone, everyone has equal set of emotions and, yeah. and depending on how you let them steer you is where you go. Exactly. You know, there's no no manual for it. So you never were an addict. You don't seem to have those issues. That doesn't seem to be your. No, I, I, I would joke that I'm too lazy to be an addict. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I get it. I get it. You know, no, I just said uh, just I didn't have a taste for it. Yeah, you know? my son's the same way. Like I'd rather I'd rather wallow in my emotions, um, because what I figured out very quickly is like whatever you took to hide your problems your problems are waiting for you on the other end so what's the point exactly it's just a it's just putting them off a little bit longer exactly and so yeah, like, that, that makes it worse i'm like so what's the use of doing this you know that's just how i felt about it you did a film that i i want to hear more about this called forgiveness a dramatic story about the president of the united states of america apologizing for america's role in slavery yes tell me about this yeah, well, the germination of it, believe it or not, came when George W. was in office. And we remember back then when we thought he was the worst president ever? When we did, and now I really would want him back. Yeah, exactly. It's like, what happened? Everything. Yeah. And my, my oldest son was probably about eight or nine at the time. And we got on the conversation of slavery. And it's like, have you ever, has the president ever apologized for slavery? And I was like, no, I don't think so. And he's like, well, he should have. And, you know, out of the mouths of babes. And so my then wife kind of, elbowed me and said maybe you should write that and I wrote it in like two days wow. and then I just kind of put it in a drawer because the scope of it is like I don't know how I'm going to get this done and then an opportunity came to me where a producer stepped up um, Black Hollywood Education and Resource Center they said hey we want to fund your next film and I said oh, okay I have this script and then we did it and uh, you know we did casting two-thirds of the cast were friends and then the rest we did a casting call and uh the rest is kind of history oh my god i can't wait to see this i can't you won a lot of awards for your films and so this one did you ever get a president did you ever go to bush and try to get him to apologize or no or happened? We didn't um you know the hope was that i would get obama to see it yeah so, um we we did a run at the west side pavilion theaters for 10 days and it sold out all 10 days, which was unprecedented. We did the Oscar run. We mm -hmm. got a write-up in the Huffington Post. We screened it at the Congressional Black Caucus with uh, Maxine Waters. Wow. Oh. And uh, it did, uh, you know, it, it, a lot of people really still talk about it, uh, which is great. And um, yeah. Has the president ever apologized? I, I'm not supposed to know. Not officially. I think... Uh, Clinton apologized when the Rwanda genocide was ha happening, but for the overall oh, no. United States participation in slavery, that has not happened because politically there's a fear of, you know, reparations and 
than oh. a, than all that stuff, you know. But you know, racism and slavery and the plight of the African American is kind of the elephant in the room for this country. Isn't it weird? It's and, like uh, our original sin. It is. And then and, and until that reckoning happens, I don't think America is really going to be where it needs to be. I know. I agree with you 100%. My great great grandmother was Harriet Beecher Stowe. I think we talked about this. And I think yeah. I mentioned to you, I went to Phillips Academy in Massachusetts. Oh, that's right. And I stayed in Stowe House. Oh, my God. Where Uncle Tom's Cabin was written. I stayed uh, I stayed in that very dorm on that on that piece of land. Oh my goodness, that's so weird. You know, Lydia is like we're practically related. We're related. You know what's weird? My um she wrote that book to get white men who the only people who could vote were white men, not women couldn't vote. She mm -hmm. wrote the book to get her husband and all his friends to vote to abolish slavery. She was an abolitionist and it was like she had to she made them so lovable. She was trying to write the story of the humanity of slaves that they were real people. Can you believe that we didn't consider them real people? I just can't get over this. I can't get over the fact that even my mother in El Paso, Texas, had colored water fountains. It was called, you know, separate yeah. water fountains. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's uh, unfortunately, whether you agree or not, I think, uh, I don't want to say racism, but yeah. people doing bad to each other is kind of the human condition. You Isn't know, it? if, if yeah. it's not racism, it's anti-Semitism. If it's not anti-Semitism, it's something different religions. If it's tribal. Misogyny. It's misogyny. <laughs> Woman. Women, you know, and, and unfortunately, until that, again, is reconciled, you know, mankind's okay. never going to really elevate. Why? Okay, what is it about human nature that, to me, I think, when babies are born, they're lovable and loving. Is Are we born greedy and materialistic? Do we want... You know. No, I think I think it's more of a um, survivalist mm -hmm. thing of who you are. You want to protect your tribe, and also you think that someone's taking away your rights or your if, if well, they have your, your rights, your, your rights to problem. exist, your right to procreate, to to propagate your your species. I mean, it's it's all very primal because slavery still exists all over the world today. It you does, know? doesn't it? does like in africa there's still slavery there's in, in asia there's still slavery oh uh, unfortunately that's and the the pyramids were built by slaves the, yeah. the monuments all over the world were built by slaves if you look at the greatest bu buildings they're all built by slaves really yeah. the white house was built by slaves oh my god yeah. but uh you know we, we could talk ad infinitum about it but, yeah uh, we don't want to go down that path right now i mean we to me, that's a whole subject we could actually spend hours on. But to me, I don't know. I think people are born good. And I think we learn these things. We learn. Oh, it's a definitely a learned behavior. It's definitely a learned behavior. And, you know, it's all a product of your environment. Because, you know, there's there's crappy people in all races. So it's. <laughs> Did your father experience anything like this? Any kind of racism or any kind of police? Well, I don't want to say police. Um. Well, yeah, police. Well, um, what happened with your and dad? His, and it's in his biography. Like he got his first TV job out here in Hollywood. They flew him out here, and he they put him up in the Beverly Hills Hotel. He rented a nice convertible, and he was driving up and down Sunset Boulevard, oh. and uh, from Crescent Heights to the Beverly Hills Hotel, it took him four hours because cops pulled him over every mile, basically. And at one point, they handcuffed him for to a tree for three hours. Why? Okay, what year was this? This was in the, in the late 50s. Oh, no. Oh, my God. You're kidding. And so that was his first taste of abject racism. So they handcuffed him to a tree. Why? Because he was driving a fancy car? It didn't look like and he, he, was, and he was And he was black, yeah. Oh. Just to put him in his place. I'm so sorry. And he almost quit acting because of that until his dad told him, you know, no, you have a, a job to do. You need to do it. He's so, oh my God. And he got, that was the only thing that happened before he became famous, right? I hope. Well, I mean, there's other things, but that was like the biggest example. But coming up in Hollywood and getting jobs, you know, he dealt with racism on, on sets too. Really? Yeah, like when he would do some Westerns, they would put rattlesnakes in his trailer and 
cow manure in his boots and crap and give him like the bad horse and this that and the other thing and you know like jackie robinson he kind of holds a certain visage it's like i can't blow this because wow. you know so he carried a lot of weight he took a lot of slings and arrows for wow. he's like a pioneer he's like a he kind yeah. of like cleared the path right mm -hmm. i mean but you know the there, there's always a cost to being that person yeah too. so yeah. Wow. So did he harbor? Did he tell you about this, or did he hide it? Was it something that he was embarrassed by, or like? No, he told me about it. He oh, told yeah. me about it. Yeah, especially after he he got sober. Oh yeah. Yeah. Then you what know. Did... He told me everything. You know. Wow. Yeah. How old were you when that happened? When you got sober? Oh geez. So it was twenty years ago. Twenty twenty. So, two thousand four. Oh, okay. And he'd been in in and out of rehabs for a while too, just trying and stopping and, and so I mean, you don't get it on the first try. Yeah. But then you know, in I guess in two thousand four, you know, he finally called my brother and I and say, hey, "Can you guys take me to Promises?" Oh wow, really? So we we took him. God bless him. What did he die of, and what was going on with him in the um, hospital? Yeah. He, he had severe COPD. I don't know what you know what that is, but I don't it, really know what it is. It, I it's hearing. chronic um, obstruction of the breathing pathways. Okay. And in a sense, his lungs were failing him. Oh, and he had COVID, right? He had got COVID before. Well, this? he had gotten COVID like in 2020. Okay. But, you know, the guy is an iron horse. He had prostate cancer three times. He has one kidney. Okay. He had degenerative heart disease. He had emphysema. Um. Wow. So he was a he was a war horse, and wow. it's the COPD that he finally succumbed to. God, um, was he a smoker? He smoked for a long time. Yeah, yeah. I used to smoke in the beginning in college. Yeah, he smoked for a long time. So I don't know if the culmination of that, you know, and and the the addiction issues probably, um, uh, there's a there's a a cost to that. So yeah. yeah. But he lived a beautiful and a long life, and he really did a lot. He was a groundbreaking. Yeah, he was a, really a, I, I call him a three-dimensional man. You you saw all sides of, at yeah. least, I, you know, you know, and, in, in, you know, in, in public, you know, you know, he had the persona, but then seeing behind closed doors too, you know, you see, I saw it all. You were very humble. You seem to have such a sweet demeanor. Like, you're not. A, a, a obnoxious bratty star of a big legend you know you're you're really a humble i love humility is my favorite value by the way my favorite um character characteristic of people so where does that come from were you raised you know you were raised, lavished with with tons of wealth maybe i don't know were you given everything you wanted or did he teach you to discipline you or i mean i didn't i didn't lack for anything if that's what you meant <laughs> yeah I mean, we, we grew up in Malibu and Hancock Park and I had a wow. tree house. We had an indoor swimming pool, we had all these people coming over and stuff like that. And, you know, just Hancock Park, the mansions are humongous. We have friends who live there. Their house takes up three, almost a block, half a block. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 And, uh, you know, got to go to Laker games and all that. You know, we did all that stuff. So, wow. but uh, I don't know where the humility comes from. Were you religious? Uh, did you have an upbringing in church at all, or was he religious? Or what he was he, when, spiritual. He was spiritual. That's what I believe in. I'm yeah. When I got yeah, so he, he was a spiritual man, you know, and especially with the program, you know, and the higher power and everything. Yeah. Well, um, but no, I never, I never stuck to one singular denomination. You know, I like, I like kind of taking the different parts from each one and making it my own. Yeah. Yeah. My son, I asked my son, social studies teacher, what religion he is. He says, Western Orthodox baseball. Ah, That's okay. a good answer. Because it's yeah. like religions about what tribe you belong to, what hat you wear, what kind of like weird, you know, rituals you do, wh which direction you pray. It's mm -hmm. all kind of a superficial to me. It's a lot of ritual, but it's really the heart that matters. It's what's inside you and you're being a good, you know, God can be good orderly direction or just love. No, it's true because, you know, religion is an instrument. It can be used for good. It can also, has been used for bad. You know, yeah. we go back to slavery, you know, religion was used to subjugate a lot of people.
Unbelievable. And, and put women in their quote unquote place, you know, right. as a religion. So it's not what it, it's not the message, it's the messenger. As they take rights away. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, what's going on in the Middle East is a proof positive. What's, what's that, you know? Oh, right. God. I, I don't know. I have a lot to say about that someday, too. But to me, to be a great peacemaker is to, you know, I actually wrote an article about religion and it's the title is you mean george burns and gandhi aren't in heaven but pedophile priests are in a technicality right you know, it, it's not about the ritual it's about your heart it's really about abiding in love mm -hmm. not reacting and retaliating too quickly but being a little smarter than the not seeing your enemy as an yeah. enemy empathy you know having empathy. empathy for the plight of what they're going through yeah and relating on that level because everyone's you know everyone bleeds red everyone cries everyone has the same emotions we all hurt the same mm -hmm. what are you teaching you have two kids i have three kids three kids okay what are their names and how old are they um malcolm is 25 olivia is 21 and xavier is 12 oh my god yeah so you get one in puberty what's that like what's it like having a 12 year old now um, it's definitely resetting the clock and uh, he's growing and he's, he's musky and he wants a lot. He he's asks for a lot. And, you know, it was, it, middle school has kind of been a, been a bit of a boot camp for him, an adjustment period. Why? In what way? Well, just, you know, dealing with multiple classes, multiple teachers, multiple personalities, peer pressure, social media. Yeah, social media. And I want to ask you about that. Do you allow him to have a cell phone at school and does he does he have access to all the apps and TikTok? He has access to certain apps and the cell phone use kind of goes um based on his behavior. Mm. You know, I'm like he'll get a phone, then we'll take it away, then he'll get a phone, then we'll take it away. And um it's like I often joke, I can't imagine growing up to school with a cell phone. I would probably still be in middle school if I if I had a cell phone. <laughs> Do you uh, monitor his, you know, I know on Twitter, I'm in state of shock every now and then actual porn will arrive, will show up. And I'm like, what? Really? Yeah. Um, no, I bookmark all that. I mean, no, I, I, I'm just kidding, but I'm. <laughs> <laughs> you are funny, by the way. I got a funny text from you earlier. Anyway. But um, yeah. no, it, it, it's tough. He's not on Twitter. I think, I think he's just on TikTok. And um, even that is like, you know. You can't shield your kids from everything, but as parents, you know, if they're exposed to it, we explain, we have to explain the proper context of what it is, because they're going to see it anyway. If you tell them you can't see that, they're going to sneak right. and see it anyway. So you got to tell them, hey, X, Y, Z, this is what this is. It's like prohibition. If you keep it, they're going to want it more. Yeah, exactly. Want it more. So, but it scares me that the comparisons kids are making to other people and their secret you can order drugs through TikTok. You can do things that are weird that no one knows about. I've been, I'm a member of a social media safety network. Mm -hmm. It's a friend of mine whose son was bullied mercilessly, and a lot of kids lost their lives. They're they're bullied in middle yeah, school. Yeah, that, that that digital bullying is real. Yeah, and um, it's a uh, you you feel for these kids oh, because they, they try and live up to these expectations that are almost impossible and. You know, the one thing, sure, grades are good, fine. But, you know, as parents, his mom and I aren't together, but we we, we work in lockstep to co-parent. Good. That, you, know, you just be a good person and that you have good values and then the rest will take care of itself. Yeah, that's true. And if you love them, they know you love them and they're at a safe harbor to come yeah. home and, and they feel heard. Yeah. Understood, yeah. So... so so what is your most exciting thing? What are you working on now? What do you want to be doing? What is your biggest dream? And what are you doing? And tell me more about your filmmaking. Well, right now, um, you know, we're, we're trying to put together the pieces for the documentary about dad. Oh, I can't wait for this. Yeah. And it, um, the tentative title is called For What It's Worth. And um, oh, right. that and then, you know, I'm doing my talk show, which you're going to be on soon. Yes, I can't wait. Where do you film that? It's a studio. We film that at the Pasadena Media Group. It's oh, a public I love that. And um, a friend of mine connected me with them, and 
He said, hey, what do you want to do? It's like, well, I've always wanted to do like either a movie review show or a show or just talk to creators about how they started, got their start. And so 10 episodes later, here we are. Oh, cool. Yeah. I, I'm honored to be invited. I'd love to. I love the fact that you're in an actual studio. Mm-hmm. We're, we're starting another one with Stella Parton, Dolly Parton's sister. She's very cool. Stella Parton. Um, Stella Parton's Parton, younger sister. Wait, and how many sisters does she have? Ha- what? How many sisters oh, does she have? A lot of sisters and brothers. I Maybe 11, or I could be wrong. Well, that's crazy, because I know about the other sister. Which one? I, the other sister. Like, oh. Oh, I don't know that one. No, yeah, it's, that, that oh, one. It's very cool. Stella's like Dolly. You know. Yeah, no, Julia is the other sister. She, oh. she, she is the black sheep, if you know what I mean. Okay, yeah, I think I, I think I know what you mean. So we're we're looking at studios too to do it live, so we can film it in an actual studio with a TriCaster or whatever. I don't know. Yeah, what I mean doing. that's what they have. Yeah. And um, yeah, like when you come, you'll you'll see the setup. Oh, cool! Anytime, I love Pasadena. It's yeah. like an old town there, and they have really cool. It's a world unto itself. Yeah. You know. I love LA. Do you travel a lot? Um, I have traveled a lot in the past. You know, I've been. I haven't been to Asia yet, but hopefully that's on the bucket list. But you yeah. know, just work, being with my dad and we I've traveled a lot of places. I bet. You know, a lot of adventures. Any hijinks on the set that you want to talk? Are there any scandalous, crazy stories of, you know, that you remember? They um, they asked me this to the I'm, Johnny Carson show interview. They asked me about scandalous stories, and I was such a nerd. I went. I acted like a goody goody and they went, she's boring. This was way back in the 80s. They go, we don't want her on. Now I have more stories than you would. I have Hollywood horror stories that are hilarious, but. No scandalous stories with my, well, I mean, we had like a harrowing story. Like I used to work for him as his assistant and he, there was this number of years where he did a speaker store and he got hired to do uh, MC the African movie awards in Nigeria with Vivica Fox. Oh, so, well- we flew there, and as soon as we got off the plane, everything kind of went sideways. They were just had ulterior motives, different agendas, and then like the venue was three hours away over a, a pothole filled roll road where like uh, livestock and kids were walking in the way. Everyone had an AK forty seven, like you would carry a pocketbook, um, and it was crazy. And oh. at one point. Vivica Fox tried to fight the promoter and I had to hold her back, literally. <laughs> um, we got back to the hotel and they wouldn't let us leave the hotel. And thank God, the owner of the hotel was a Nigerian general who, guess what, loved Lugasa Jr. movies. Oh, wow. So he really <laughs> for us to, to get out of the Nigeria. And um, when we got to the airport, the people that brought us there were waiting for us with machine guns. And it was like a literal Mexican standoff. Wow, God, how weird. And then we got on the airplane and we literally didn't feel safe until they said, you can turn your seatbelt sign off because we thought they were going to shoot a rocket at us. Oh, how scary. You're kidding me. Nigeria is a very strange country. It is. I mean, it's a, it's a, unfortunately, it's, it's a resource rich, but highly corrupted. Um, right. And then, and as a result of that, the, in a constant state of chaos which is unfortunate because if they are able to keep the funds from their resources it'd be a very different story but that's kind of part and parcel of most of the african countries but you know that's another story yeah yeah i always felt like i had the solutions to everything at one point you know just love each other be peacemakers Mm -hmm. that's a good start to start with within yourself yeah yeah but um so you have the you have the podcast and you're working on the documentary now. Is you do you have one big huge movie you want to make or do you what is your favorite kind of movie? Well, surprise surprise, it always kind of veers towards comedy. Oh. Um, you know, I have a a film uh, that I wrote called Happy and Free, which is kind of semi autobiographical. You know, because growing up in Hollywood or as a, as a professional, while well, you're trying to chase your gig, you're doing all kinds of odd jobs and and uh, running into even odder people. <laughs> so that's what that script is about. Oh, how fun. I love the yeah. title, Happy and Free. Yeah. And then I have another one, which 
you know, it, it you know how it is with projects, it's two steps forward, three steps awesome. back. And uh, hopefully that'll get off the ground one day. You know, it's about two rappers that get stranded in Europe and they kind of go with the fish out of water culture explosion okay. thing. Yeah, fish out of water is really good. So wait, do you come up with that? How do you, what is your creative process? And do you write every day? Are you consider yourself more a director or a writer or just a creative thinker I, that comes I, up with ideas? Um, all of the above. You know, I, I write my own stuff. I also co-write and ghost write with other people too. Yeah. You know, they hire me to like make it funnier or spruce this up. So I've done that. And I've been brought on to direct projects as well or help make introductions because, you know, you do that just as a function. Yeah. As a creator. I was, I, I love directing. I didn't know how much I was going to love it until I was invited to direct someone's funny short film. And it was like, magic you know i just went oh i get to i get to play well there's nothing like the collaborative process when people are in sync and you know you're allowed to play you know you create the structure and once the structure is there then people can play and bounce ideas off of each other and there's no egos involved and well that's the best it's the best yeah the best. yeah we have I've, I've known about egos a lot i've had a lot i worked with a lot of iconic male stars and my first movie was with james Earl jones oh wow okay and Jose Ferrer and Lila Kedroba, three Oscar winners. I mean, James Earl Jones had just come off The Great White Hope, and he was just won the Tony on Broadway, and he was an up and coming star in 1980. So, mm -hmm. 80s when the movie came out, but it was great working with, and he was such a great man. He was such a gentle spirit, and he brought his wife to the set. But the producers were another whole story. The movie industry is ruled, is run by some, there's some sleaze bags in this industry. Yeah, there are. I mean, you know, once they get that semblance of power, you know, I think, uh, you know, power enhances who you are as a person. If yeah. You're, if, you're, if you're a scumbag, you're going to be a scumbag. And if you're, <laughs> you don't hear about the nice ones. You only hear about the bad ones. That's true. That's, that's sad. I mean, the reason I love the industry is because there are so many great creative people here. Steven yeah. Spielberg, I I met with him right away at this great meeting. Lucas, you know, um, Scorsese, mm -hmm, you, mm -hmm. you know, your dad would have been so much fun to work with. But yeah. and I have me two stories, but I don't want to ruin anyone's life at this point, to be honest with you. Like I have a couple, but luckily I never had to do that. I never had to do anything for a career move. I'm He's so lucky. I got it through messing up the first audition horribly, and they laughed so hard they couldn't believe I did this. Terrible mistake, and that's how I got the part, you know. That's but, but I don't really want to name names anymore. I don't want to ruin it. I know it sounds well. There's no value in it now. I you mean, know, why betray? You know, he's still working in the industry, and he's we're still friends. And I never, I don't want to bring it up. You know. Well, it's in, it's an interesting dynamic because with the Me Too movement, sure the men are vilified, but you know the women also say they it's a weird agreement that you know in order to do this to make it then you have to do that and they they do the dance and some some women do it and they go on to have fabulous careers you're right it's you weird. know it's a weird pill to swallow but because of that it perpetuates that behavior there is a spoken agreement back in the 80s there was an, a very blatant agreement with advertisers and poster bikini poster i i would just assume it was just assumed you had to do a bikini poster if you were going to be an 80s sex symbol and there was no two ways about it and you were going to be treated like an object we yeah. all made this agreement in a weird way we didn't think twice about it and well, later we go oh, wow yeah i mean the way i see it that every person has a certain set of skills and yeah. your journey is to figure out what works for you to get where you need to go some people it's sexuality some people it's their craft yeah. some people they're great writers and you have to own your set of skills in order to get where you need to go like a lot of the the, the best actresses of all time you know they only had to show some skin once just to set yeah. a precedent and then they never had to do it again right but they just need to show that they could go to that place wow that's really yeah. This is a usury system. We're using each other. It's like a user society. Yeah, exactly. You know, so, I mean, you get out of the victim mentality and say, okay, I have this. I'm going to use this to get where I need to go. You're going to get what you're going to get. And then there you go. 
and it's, you know it's it's just I know I just my first movie I had to like outfox them not to go topless I did every trick in the book I did like hide behind a big rock in Greece talk yeah. to the Greek wardrobe lady she couldn't speak my language we were like lots of hand gesturing and she figured yeah. it out I know what we can do and it was like we won but it was such an outwitting the yeah. bad guys you know as women and, uh, uh, an actress um she's an upcoming actress she lived next door to me at the time and um she had gotten this part in this pretty decent movie and she was playing a stripper and she was giving a lap dance and she had to go topless and she was she was very like back and forth with it it's like oh i don't know should i show my breasts or should i know i don't know i'm on the fence and da 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 and I, you know, being the pig that I am, I was like, you know, you need to show your breasts. <laughs> and, 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 I, and, I, and I explained to her exactly what I just said, because, you know, you just, it's just another tool in your toolbox. And once you do it, you're not going to have to do it. Because if you do it too much, then that's yeah. what they're going to expect of you. But if you do it just enough to set a precedence, oh then you can act as well. Then, and now she's <laughs> a star on the big cbs show that's been going for seven years wow yeah you you're on to something there it's kind of kind of sad in a weird way but back in my era we just it was just part of the thing if you wore a skirt you were going to be oh i do have to say oh no i better not tell that story there it's really weird there's one guy who did something horrific when i first walked into my first agent uh, agent meeting mm -hmm. and i thought it only happened to me and i I don't want anyone to know his name. And we told another actress this story without naming him. And she named his name out loud. She goes, oh, you mean that guy? I'm like, it happened what? to you too? Of course it happened to every woman that he met. Yeah. No. It's, Did you see the Marilyn movie came out last year with the with the, the Spanish actress? No, but I heard it was really good. I didn't see it. It's really good. It's very hard to watch. Oh, really? And, and, and it shows she goes through that whole process. Like, it's so Marilyn Monroe went through it you know yeah nancy reagan there she went through it too i mean it unfortunately yeah. it's the and it and it's both men and women you know that you know these people in power they'll prey on the uninformed isn't that weird i mean i, I i'm shocked that i'm even in shock about it i act like i'm from kansas i mean i knew this going in but i had the sense of wonder and innocence because i love Haley mills and pollyanna and you know i i thought maybe it wouldn't happen to me Mm -hmm. but it did but it didn't really it's really kind of cool how you can keep your head above water and yeah you gotta I mean, turn if you take a certain stance for yourself you know just like any bully you kind of punch them in the nose they'll back off yeah exactly you know, i think that's what it is and, and a lot of people will come in thinking that they have to kind of quote unquote sell their soul in order to make it and you don't you don't have to do that you know you just got to stand for something coming in that's true, but it is a, a business of looks. It is a business of people want to see pretty people or interesting people, or at least women, at least in my era. You know, mm -hmm. they didn't want to see, that's why I love independent film. I started doing a lot of independent films in the 90s. I did Damage Done, where I played a heroin addict, and I was at a bar smoking Marlboro Reds and shooting up. Mm -hmm. Shooting up was a horrible movie, but it was so well done. And um, they won a lot of awards at Sundance, at Slam Dance. Okay. And so it was fun doing these kind of movies where you got to be nitty gritty. And like Charlize Theron got to do Monster. Mm -hmm. Wait, take her makeup off. Farrah Fawcett did Burning Bad and Extremities to undo that sex symbol thing. Mm -hmm. To like be raped on stage every night on Broadway. To just prove she could act, you know, because you have to yeah. overcome that pretty thing. Yeah. It's hard for women. It's been hard. It's, it's hard for women. I mean, Meryl Streep's different. She was a character actor. And Helen Mirren, they're allowed to age. But if you were ever considered pretty, you, you know, you're put out to pasture once you hit yeah. 30, 40. I mean, Helen was gorgeous. I mean, she was in Caligula. It's all her kibbles and bits shown. Oh, yeah, that's right. And Taylor Hackard is her husband, right? That's right. And he, he directed direct Opposite of Gentleman. Yeah. He directed your dad's Oscar-winning performance. God, yeah. your dad was good in that movie. Still holds up too. I can say that without bias. It still holds up. He's out. I remember his performance over all the performances in that movie. Isn't mm -hmm. that weird? He really stood out. He's always stood out to me. It's like this one actor. Mm -hmm. 
Everyone stayed away. I mean, Richard Gere was good. Yeah, he was good, but I don't want to say he's hit or miss, but he's kind of hit or miss in in type of thing. I recently watched uh, Pretty Woman. Oh, yeah. You know, just to just it was a, oh, let me just rewatch this and oh, I yeah. like that movie. And, you know, Julia Roberts was so effervescent in that film. You know, so you good. how good she was. And uh, yeah. Of oh, Gary Marshall, he was an old friend of mine. Mm -hmm. he directed that. God, it was so much fun talking to you. Can we do this again? Oh, uh, anytime. You're fun, and it's so great working with you. I can't wait to see our movie that we did. Yes, yes, yes. And then, um, well, you know, I need another guest for April. So if it, the schedule aligns, you know, maybe you can come and be the next guest. Yeah, I've got to figure out the dates because I'm doing some public speaking coming up. And... Yeah. As soon as I find out, then we'll see if we match. Or I was interested in the Linda Blair, too, but she's... She said yes, but it's hard to track her down. So we'll get her. She's out and acting on a ranch, right? With her dogs. Yeah, she's with her dogs and stuff. So. Oh, God, it's awesome talking to you. I love you very much. I love your energy, your spirit. And my heart goes out to you over your father's passing. But I know it's going to be, it's wonderful that you have this legacy that you can now show the world his life mm -hmm. in documentary. Yeah, that's the idea, you know. And uh, it'll happen. And it'll, it'll happen in God's time, and you know, you know, his legacy is forever because he's in movies and TV. So he's not gone. He's just not here. Actually, people become bigger in our hearts later. Sometimes it's it's interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of actors don't have any effect, but this that I know your father does. Yeah, and he lives on through you and your kids. Yeah. Okay, it was great talking to you, Sat. Is it Sati? Where did you get your name? Real quick, I want to find out. Where did Eric, the, I was named after Eric Satie. He was a French composer. Oh, I love Satie. There you go. See? That's where your name comes from. That's my, I've got to play the music. When I edit this together, I'm going to play the Satie, my favorite um, Satie comp composition. There you go. Okay, cool. All right. Okay. See you later. Bye. Godspeed. Blessings.